when I was a when I was a youth, I, I ordered a T-shirt that was advertised in a Unitarian Universalist publication, and on the front of the T-shirt was emblazoned a flaming, fiery red question mark, and under it the printed slogan, "The answer is to question." And I felt very subversive wearing this T-shirt around. Uh, what I didn't what I didn't understand um, was that the flaming question mark. Um, looked an awful lot, like almost identical with the logo for the Calgary Flames hockey team, which is a C that's on fire. Um, and so I would wear this T-shirt around, and people would come up to me and say, "Oh, I didn't know you were a hockey fan. That's a wow. Is that a is that a Calgary Flames T-shirt?" And I was like, "No, it's a religious T-shirt." What I was trying to convey, and the T-shirt really didn't do it, was that Unitarian Universalism is a faith tradition that embraces questions and doubts, and encourages us to actively seek out meaning and truth through the acting, asking of questions. Over the past several weeks, um, people attending our worship services left more than 50 questions in the question box that was located at the back of the sanctuary. Um, a couple things. First of all, most of the questions were appropriate, so that's good. Um, and then also, um, there, were, there, were only, there were only 50, um, which means, I, I guess, that you know, about um, you know, 75% of the congregation just doesn't have any questions. So you guys are talking to people who don't, who don't have any questions. The questions range from the broadly philosophical, what is the meaning of life, asked by two people, uh, to the trivial, do you like pie? Um, <laughs> And I think the, do the dozens of questions I received provided me, I'd like to think, a glimpse into the types of things that people in this congregation are sort of thinking about and wrestling with. For example, there was a whole constellation of questions having to do with theological diversity in our congregation. Uh, here are three of those questions. One person said, quote, many of us are agnostic, atheist, humanist, and secular. Do you think you do enough to acknowledge our approach? A second asked, why are you used so against any references to the Bible? This person went on to make an impassioned case for greater use of the Bible in worship services. And meanwhile, a third asked, can Unitarians do more to incorporate the traditions of Buddhism? And I feel like rather than try to answer these questions, I should try to figure out who wrote each of them and invite them to all come down together and to kind of moderate a discussion between them. I remember uh, when I was just starting out in ministry, I was curious about how the church I was serving was with kind of traditional churchy language. Um, and so on one of my first Sundays, I decided to end the service by having them sing Amazing Grace. In the receiving line afterwards, one person came up to me swooning. Oh, I love Amazing Grace, she said. I wish we could sing it every Sunday. And the very next person in the receiving line snapped, I hate Amazing Grace. We should never sing it again. <laughs> it's been said that the art of ministry is disappointing people at a rate that they can handle. <laughs> and so we, will, we won't never sing it again, and we won't sing it every Sunday, and neither of you are going to be happy. But seriously, if diversity is something that we really, truly want, then the people who want Bible every week are going to be disappointed. And the people who want there to be no Bible are going to be disappointed. And the people who want a lot more Buddhism are probably going to be disappointed too. Part of living into our diversity is learning to appreciate the stuff that doesn't work for you. The word you hate may be the word the person sitting next to you needs to hear. But I think another part of being a spiritually mature Unitarian Universalist is being able to do the work of translation. I think it's possible for even if, if, if you are a person who, who really finds the idea of God or the concept of God meaningful, I think it's possible for you to listen God into a sermon in which God is not explicitly mentioned. And similarly, if God is a word that doesn't work for you at all, I think you can do the work of translation and, and substitute another word or another idea and to, make the, to listen into the sermon to make it work for you. Staying on the kind of the worship um, questions, there were a number of worship questions. Another person submitted a card that read, 
how can you use understand the word worship? Dictionary definitions refer to God. This word worship has a lot of baggage. And I think there are several ways to approach this question. There's the old line that the word worship derives from the old English worth skippy, and that we should consider the worth skippy meaning worth shaping, and that we should consider this time together to be an active experience of shaping what is of worth to us. And that said, I think in English we have what are called transitive and intransitive verbs. Transitive verbs require an object, and intransitive verbs do not. And I don't see any reason that worship can't be an intransitive verb, a verb that does not require an object. One, one can worship without worshiping someone or something. One can just worship. But I think my favorite way of thinking about this comes from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who I'm going to talk a little about a little bit later. Emerson wrote, a person will worship something, have no doubt about that. We may think our tribute is paid in secret, in the dark recesses of our hearts, but it will out. That which dominates our imaginations and our thoughts will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship. For what we are worshiping, we are becoming. And I think what Emerson is getting at here is what, is what contemporary scholars of religion refer to as, as human beings, as, as being our species name should be, they say, homo religiosus, that, uh, the, the, the religious being. The religious impulse, they would say, is encoded into what it means to be human. And since, and since we'll worship something, worshiping here is a pretty good option. Another person asked, why do we celebrate Christmas? I do, but am not a Christian. I might better be described as a believer in Jesus, the man, the teacher, but not the Christ. Tradition, yet, yes, but, but more than that, why do we celebrate Christmas here? Um, in fact, uh, this person signed the question, and it was actually a question that came up the last time I led a new member class. So, so what do you all do with Christmas? Um, and I said, you know, gave the answer, oh, we, do, we do many different things with Christmas. Um, but I think that the, 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 answer that I'd, the answer that I'd like to give is that um, celebrating Christmas and, and celebrating Jesus, the, the holiday doesn't need to be an exclusive one. I remember that at, the, at one UU congregation, when they do child dedications, um, the ritual, and they do it, they do it all very much like a baptism, um, when, the, when the child is presented... Um, the congregation does in a responsive reading, you know, say the child's name is Sally, they will say, Sally is born unto us one more redeemer. And that's what they do for each child that's born. Each child is born one more redeemer. Um, in our hymnal, and we'll do at Christmas Eve, we'll do the Sophia Lion Fawz, uh, each night a child is born is a holy night. And so I would say that our Unitarian Universalist celebration of of Christmas is celebrate, celebrating not God in particular coming into being imminence through one being only, one time only, but I think it is welcoming in this, in this sense of the larger that, that each child that is born is, is holy. And um, if, you're a, if you're a theist, that, um, that, that God comes into being through, through each child that's born or if you're, a, if, you're, if you're not a theist, that, that with each child that's born comes you know, a greater possibility for human redemption. Skipping the question I got wrong at the first service. It was my longest answer, and the, the answer was really should have been, I don't know. Um, one person submitted a question um, wondering. I'll go to the, the. One person submitted a question wondering if I had a favorite piece of UU trivia, um, and and I do, and it's and it's actually one that's um, it's really startling. So allow me to read you a quote by Robert Richardson uh, that it happens in his biography, his wonderful biography of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Richardson writes, on March. 29th, 1832, the 28-year-old Emerson visited the tomb of his young wife, Ellen, who had been buried a year and two months earlier. 
He was in the habit of walking from Boston out to her grave in Roxbury every day, but on this particular day, he did more than commune with the spirit of the departed Ellen. He opened the coffin. And so my favorite bit of UU trivia is that Ralph Waldo Emerson, on at least more than one occasion, on at least two occasions, went to a cemetery to dig up the remains of his relatives and to open the coffin and to look upon them. Richardson goes on to say this about this experience, that Emerson was, quote, casting off old ties and embracing new ideas and new possibilities. Coming face to face with the dead forced Emerson to choose between the dead and the living. His sermons for April are insistently this worldly. He talked on successive Sundays about the virtues near at hand, the pleasures near at hand, and the God of the living. And so my, my favorite bit of, of UU trivia, I'm not sure why it's my favorite, but the kind of most striking bit of UU trivia um, is that this actually was something that, that we have records of, of many of the Unitarians of that day doing as a kind of a spiritual reflection that they would go and dig up family members and open the coffin and would remember that as a, um, as a kind of a reminder to... to live forward rather than, rather than live backwards. Interesting, huh? Interesting, huh? One person submitted a card with a request that I please explain my views of after death. Um, and, and so I, I'd like to say what my views are, but I'd, I'd like to say, you know, if, like, if it could be anything, here is what I would like. Um, You can, you can just imagine. <laughs> um, I like to say, I like to say that, that I'm, I'm a lover of life, and I like to say that if it were possible to choose any afterlife at all, I would definitely choose reincarnation. On the condition... <laughs> on the condition that my next life gets to be at least as pleasant and fortunate and joyful and successful as this life. Um, in the grand scheme of things, you would think that any of us here any of us here, it would seem, must have, you know, hit the jackpot more or less to be able to live the life we're living and not any of the other possible lives that are, um, you know, immeasurably worse than our own life that we could have lived. The odds, if you look at the course of human history, the odds are not in our favor to have a life as, as good as this one. So yes, reincarnation in the next life, as long as it turns out to be at least as pleasant. But the odds are not in my favor. In reality, though, I don't, I don't personally believe in an afterlife. Um, it's, not a, it's not an idea that, that resonates with my own theology, um, although I do respect those who do hold such a belief or imagine such a reality. Um, and, the, and I know from from pastoral conversations, the number of Unitarian Universalists who do um, believe in, um, you know, a soul's life after death or a heaven um, is uh, larger than many of us would guess. Two different cards were submitted asking me to comment on a theology of evil. Um, those cards included questions like, what is evil? Define evil according to the UU Church. Do you believe there is ultimate good and ultimate evil? Or do you think that things are just relative, just what people think it is? Where are good and evil located, from without or from within? Um, so I'll say, in my own personal theology, I reject the idea of evil as a motive force in the universe. There is no kind of, there's no kind of spirit of evil or evil being that, that travels around um, and causes trouble or inhabits people. Um, I understand evil in human terms, but I don't reject the term evil. I, I am generally for its use, and I think that the word, the word evil can be used really quite effectively. Um, for me, evil has, has, I like to think of it as having three constituent parts. First of all, for an act to be evil, it has to have volition. It has to be intentional. An accident can't be evil. Um, second, it has to inflict significant harm. We don't want to use the term evil 
to describe things that aren't you know, significantly harmful. And, and third, um, the action has to be, and this is where you get into different, different ideas, it has to be, um, we have to decide that it's unjustifiable. And that would seem like a working definition. So, so genocide and, and terrorism and torture and um, attacking an abortion clinic would all be evil. And I'd also use the word evil to um, describe the actions of that, that person who made the news back in September, the man who, who bought up the rights to market an AIDS drug with the intention of increasing the price by 4,000%. That that, 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 would, that would strike me as, I would, I would call that action evil. Um, that it, it is intentional, it inflicts harm, and it is, and I would term, I would, I would use in my own moral, my own moral compass would call, would call that action unjustified and unjustifiable. But I think that there's also a larger question about evil, um, and, and which is the question about whether evil is systemic or whether evil is individual. Um, does, does, evil, does evil exist because of systems that kind of um, allow for it and, and kind of create it? You know, we think of, we think of institutional racism as a systemic evil, as, as sexism as an institutional evil, um, perhaps, you know, economic systems as furthering uh, evil outcomes. Or is, or is evil something that's done by an individual actor? And so we address it at the level of individual. Um, Reinhold Niebuhr, a famous Christian theologian, wrote a book probably in the 1930s called Moral Man and Immoral Society. Moral Man and Immoral Society. And Niebuhr made the case that, that individually, as individuals, we are, we are good. We're, are, we're good, but that it's, it's our social structures that, that make us evil. Um, but later, feminist theologians would come along and they would critique Niebuhr. Um, feminist theologians were some of those who would critique Niebuhr, and they would say that, that what Niebuhr has this sense of this, this idea of, of private morality and individual morality is not actually... Um, Seen and that and that he he largely ignores that and um, feminist theologians would point out that there's actually kind of you know no place in Niebuhr's system for thinking about domestic violence for example um, or other types of um, or other types of of violence and so it's very interesting that there's this there's this question and I would say that it's actually not one or the other but but both I think that evil certainly can reside within systems um, of oppression but I also think that that individuals are are capable of evil I think that's a great question um, there were some personal questions that people asked um, someone asked what are my five favorite books um, or the, the top five people of influence in my studies, of influence in my thinking. And so I want to just sort of share with you a little bit of who's on the, the top of the top of my, of my list. Um, I really, um, one, of the, one of the most influential people I've read is Marilyn Robinson. Um, she's the author of, of many novels, the best of which is Gilead. Um, but also of uh, numerous essays, um, including, I think, her best... She's got an essay collection that just came out a week ago. I haven't got it yet, but it's on my list. Um, I think my wife said she was going to get it for me for Christmas. So, um, But one of her collections of essays is called When I Was a Child, I Read Books. And Marilyn Robinson is, I think, um, one of the most influential sort of theological and philosophical thinkers. Um, I don't know if you, if you take the New York Times... Um, but Barack, Ob there's a there's a feature right now. Um, if part one has been released and, and part two is going to be released soon, in which Barack Obama went to Iowa City to interview Marilyn Robinson, and so it's this whole you can listen to it of Obama sitting down with Robinson and him asking her questions. So you know you've got good stuff when the president of the United States is choosing to interview you. Wow. Um, in terms of scholarship, um, I, I think there are, there are no scholars more exciting than Jeffrey Kripal. 
Um, the most latest, one of the most recent of his books is, is called Mutants and Mystics, and he writes about religious experience um, in a way that I think is, is very uh, lively and creative. Um, in, terms of, in terms of church work and, and theology and ecclesiology, um, the, the author of the late Forest Church um, is definitely influential, especially his book Love and Death, um, which, is, which is all about, um, all about end of life and, and making, peace with, making peace with death. In terms of, of social issues, especially anti-racism, um, I've read everything by Tim Wise. Um, we did a, a reading group here called one of his books called uh, um, Not Learning to Be White, but, uh, but White Like Me, um, Tim Wise. And then in terms of kind of arts and creativity, one of my favorite authors is Dave Eggers. I've read everything by him as well. And um, Eggers is... Um, the author of, of a memoir, The Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius, and also a um, kind of a, a f- biography of a Sudanese lost boy called What is the What? But he's also the founder of this press, McSweeney's, that I'm, that I'm deeply in love with. And, and he does all of this uh, sort of arts and creative stuff um, in a way that's, that's wholehearted, that's, that's non both both. He's not, he's not cynical, um, he's positive, but he's not afraid at combating the, the, the evils of the world, and he doesn't, doesn't shy away from that, um, but he, is, uh, he produces and supports optimistic creative art, and, and I love that. Of all of the more than 50 questions that were asked, the single, and I've got about a few minutes left, so we'll, we'll keep going, of all of the uh, questions that were asked, the, va- the, the plurality of them dealt with issues of justice making and how as individuals and how as a congregation we can um, be both, both more effective and um, more involved in justice making. I'm going to kind of read those, those questions here um, in no particular order. People, people wanted to know what are your thoughts on the education achievement gap between black and Hispanic kids and white kids in Chapel Hill schools? How can we join with our religious communities to catalyze change in our society? How can we combat our nation's surge in intolerance to migrants and refugees following the Paris attacks? How can you use address the plight of Palestinian suffering? What help can we give the homeless at the curb? And what is the best way personally of engaging with homeless persons in our community? Do you have ideas of what we as a church community could do to help with the Syrian refugee crisis? What's a good way to counter ISIS? How can we be um, an effective uh, voice for gun control? I say, wow. That's... um, about 20 percent of the cards that we received dealt with dealt with that. Um, I'm going to kind of offer a, a systematic way for for sort of thinking through some of these. Um, think back to um, a minister named Marlon Lavenhar. Marlon Lavenhar is the UU minister in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He serves the largest UU congregation um, in the country. Um, about 2,000 members in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And um, I, once, I once invited him to come speak and, um, and, and invited him to kind of charge, to kind of fire up the congregation that I was serving. And um, Marlon Lavenhar gave us a charge about social justice work that went like this. Um, he quoted from, and he said that a really inspirational person in his, in his life had been um, the work of Stephen Covey, the guy who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. And the, the Covey has a concept of, of a circle of concern, a circle of concern, which is that everything in the world that kind of we worry about and that keeps us awake at night and that, and that we think is wrong with the world. And then he says, he imagines a much smaller circle called the circle of influence, um, which is those things in which you have personal relationships where through kind of your own, your own personal relationships and positions and power um, that, you can make a, um, that you can make a difference. And so 
Um, what, Mar- what Marlin said was that in his, in his church, what he did was um, he instituted kind of a rule that the, the church would only pursue social justice activities so long as the people doing it could prove that they were acting out of a circle of influence, acting out of their circle of influence and not merely out of their circle of concern. Covey calls the that people who kind of live in the circle of concern are live in, live in reactivity, and people who live in the circle of influence live in proactivity. Um, but so, so Marlin said that, you know, those, those types of questions that you come, like if we go, you know, what is a good way to counter ISIS? Um, I will tell you that, that we could spend a lot of time as a congregation coming up with the right answer to that question, and we'd have very little to, to show for it, and and we would get pretty frustrated. Um, I happen to think that I have the right answer. <laughs> now, you know, you know it's, it's is really, really much of it to be an academic exercise. But, but some of those other questions, you know, what can you do to lessen the achievement gap among kids of different races in Chapel Hill schools, that really, that really is a, that's a question of, of influence. What, can, what impact can we make on pushing the pushing forward for, for greater voter rights in North Carolina. That's, a, that's an influence question. Um, you know, what can we do about the, the Syrian refugee crisis is a, is a question I think maybe perhaps beyond our sphere of influence, but, um, but what can we do, you know, whether it's possible for us to adopt a refugee family and make that difference. They may not be Syrian, they may be Iraqi or Somalian, or, um, or from, from Burma. But those are, those are things within our sphere of influence that it's, that it's possible to do. And so I would, um, I would actually invite us all in, in, at this time of kind of discernment. It's, it's clear that we have this, this common longing that, that I invite you to be in discernment with me about kind of what, what are the, what are the, the places that where where we can actually move. And one of the things that, that Marlin actually said was that, that when you do it that way, that you're actually, when you work within this, the circle of, of, of influence, that your influence actually grows, grows broader, that that circle, that that circle expands. Um, so I, I share with you that, that question. Um, and so with that, I will also say that my favorite pie is key lime. And um, I invite, uh, thank you for the questions, and uh, I, hope that, uh, I hope that you enjoyed my attempts at answers.